So a couple of weeks ago, I gave a presentation to the Southeast Linux Fest about Darktable and digital image processing on Linux. Um, they uploaded a VOD of it. Unfortunately, the audio is a little bit off, so I've decided to redo the presentation and demo here um, just for people who want to see it um, and for posterity's sake. Um, it, you know, it was just a, I was the first presentation of the day. I think there was just a little glitch. I am, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but the VOD is definitely messed up. So I just wanted to redo it. You know, no, uh, I'm not angry or, you know, I don't see it as anyone's fault. I'm, it, it's totally, it happens. This is their first year back after two virtual conferences due to coronavirus or, uh, yeah. So, um, it happens. You get back in the swing of things. Sometimes, um, screw ups happen. No big deal. So without further ado, I'm going to give this presentation again. Uh, yes, I am segregating my channels again. Um, I was uploading photography stuff to the other channel, but it just got too cluttered. So I'm back on this one. I want to start. Um, I want two successful things that stand on their own two feet. So I'm going to try to uh, separate these uh, ventures again. So welcome back. I am not dead. I am using Linux and still using Darktable. Um, uh, miss me? Yeah. Anyway, um, if next year you are in um, the Carolinas area and you are wanting to go to a Linux conference, uh, I may be attending self again. I'm not sure yet. Um, uh, wasn't too bad this time, um, you know, but it is definitely a Linux conference of a certain tilt. So uh, maybe not your cup of tea. So at any rate, at any rate, in any weight, at any rate, um, let's get on with this. So I'm just using my slides as I had them before. Uh, I have made some changes. Uh, the benefit of you getting this online is I've made some adaptations and changes and you don't have to look at my ugly face. Um, you know, so we, we all win a lot here. Um, so who am I? My name's obviously Leander. I uh, started photography in the early 2000s. I am a longtime Linux user. My first Linux was Mandrake in the late nineties when, it was basically uh, Red Hat with KDE. Uh, I, you know, went through Slackware, Debian, Fedora. I've used them all for a long time. Um, I did have Apple products and Adobe products for photo and video work, and really my main desktop uh, until about 2013 or so. You know, I run Linux desktops all over the place in that time. Um, you know, I was running like Black Box on Slackware in the early 2000s and stuff. So I kind of lived in both worlds. I started seriously with Darktable about version 1.6. If you follow this channel, you probably know that. And I'm also not a developer, just a user of the uh, of the product. Um, you know, I, I do a little bit of programming, but I'm not like a heavy duty programmer. All right. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, one thing I want to clear up is on language. Um, I, I'm kind of tired of apologizing for using Linux and saying, oh, you know, despite this hindrance hindrance of not having access to Adobe's tools, I'm still able to do digital photography. No, um, that's that automatically is a defensive apologetic stance that I'm no longer taking. Um, these tools are fine. Uh, these tools, um, at least for me, do what they need to do. Um, Darktable, especially, I think, is ahead in some areas. Um, I feel enabled to do these tasks with these tools that I have, not like I have to work around them. Uh, Adobe is not the only way forward. Um, and I just kind of want to set that tone for this. Uh, I'm not really looking to make a case for um, switching. Or, well, I am, but you know, not for like uh, apologetics or anything like that. I'm just uh, stating that I use these tools and I like them. Okay. What is Darktable? It is a raw processor, uh, which takes raw data from your camera, uh, which is a type of file. It's not really an image and it converts it to an image. Uh, it is a digital asset manager. Uh, so, you know, you've got a light table with star ratings, color labels, tagging and all that jazz, tethered shooting through G photo too, um, printing, geotagging and more. Um, you know, you can go all the way from ingest all the way out to printing all in dark table. Um, Geotagging, it, it does support. I would highly recommend. I live in a very beautiful part of the country. And if you do geotag your photos with a camera with a GPS, please strip that information before you upload it online. Uh, all kinds of crazy people um, go and grab GPS coordinates off photos and then trample everything to get to these beautiful spots and ruin them. So please try to keep things a little bit more secret. Thank you. Why Darktable? 
Uh, for the Linux Fest crowd, it runs on Linux. That's that's probably your best reason. Um, it's free software, and I mean free. Free isn't Libre, not free isn't gratis, although it's both. Um, it also runs on Windows and Mac OS if you want to play at home on those. Um, more modern approach to color and dynamic range uh, with the same referred workflow. Uh, it puts control of the pipeline in the user's hands. If you think you know better than the dark table devs, you can go and rearrange the orders that the modules apply to the image. Um, you can totally <laughs> screw everything up. Um, it really is the Linux of the photo world. Um, uh, if you stick with the defaults, you'll be in good shape, though, I think. There's not a lot of reason, unless you are an expert or a tinkerer to go messing with that stuff, but it is available. Uh, rapidly evolving with an active community. Um, there are two releases a year. New features are added. Old features are taken away. Uh, code is improved. Color science is improved. Uh, all that stuff. So it's not stagnant. Unlike Adobe that, as far as I know, hasn't changed a whole lot other than slower and more bugs. Um, multiple instances of almost any module. This is really cool. Uh, you can duplicate white. You can duplicate um, your color adaptive transform or chromatic adaptive transform and, pardon me, and do two separate white balances um, on different parts of the image. You can then use that to, ma you know, using the masking tool to then paint in that white balance on different parts of the image. Uh, and almost any module can be masked and have multiple instances, so very powerful. Why not Darktable? I always like to kind of play devil's advocate a little bit, um, and just to kind of let you know what you're getting in here, uh, getting into. It has a steep VI-like learning curve. Um, it is, you know, it the learning curve on this thing is pretty sharp. Um, if you put in the time, you'll get the results, as I'll show later. But, you know, you have to put in the time. Uh, it's rapidly moving. This is the downside of the active community, where workflow and modules are changing frequently. Two releases a year, lots of new... Uh, updates and and the way things work you're going to be reading the documentation some and relearning stuff a little bit more frequently than you would with Adobe uh, probably should know some color theory eventually you should probably know the difference between um, uh, chroma and uh, uh, saturation uh, things like that not heavy-duty stuff but just you know technical definitions um, community is well like most lost communities um, if you've ever participated in a mailing list or anything like that around uh, open source software, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It can be um, aggressive. Yeah, aggressive at times. Um, the moderation is getting better, um, but there is there is some, you know, it does get heated. A brief history. Um, a developer named Hanatos, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, released the initial version in April 2009. Um, the first versions were similar to Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw and Approach. It used the lab color space, um, you know, had highlights and shadow sliders and all this stuff. Uh, in 2.6, uh, a French developer, and I don't speak French, uh, I speak Japanese and a little bit of uh, Spanish, so if I butcher your poor name, I my apologies, I'm trying my best, um, uh, and it's also very late at night. <laughs> Uh, Aurelian Pierre uh, developed the filmic module based on the Blender filmic module and added the scene referred approach. This is like the the very first version of of filmic, um, you know, 1.0 uh, in version 2.6 of Lightroom. A little confusing. That's okay. Two point or uh, 4.0, excuse me. It's just around the corner. Um, it's it's the new new kid on the block. It's got a lot of new stuff in it. Uh, a new version of filmic. A new version of uh, uh, the way color balance RGB works, some new light table stuff, things of that nature, um, all that stuff. Um, also, in typical uh, open source community uh, things, there's been a couple of forks and rewrites. Uh, uh, Mr. Pierre has started one recently. Um, Hanatos, the original developer who left Darktable, started a Vulcan fork of, uh, well, not really a fork, a rewrite of... of, of um, of dark table for performance improvements. Um, hopefully those improvements make it into the main branch. Um, you know, forks and rewrites always troubling, um, because you know, they can split the community, split resources. Um, it, it really kind of, um, hopefully, like I said, hopefully some of these changes make it into the main branch. Uh, what is dark table? Not, <laughs> this is something I want to touch on. 
as someone who's semi-active in the community. It is not a free, as in gratis, Adobe Lightroom. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit why, but uh, we see a lot of people who show up and they literally just want a free Lightroom. They don't understand why the interface is different, the tools are different, and why the results are different. Um, if you just want a free Lightroom, like the Pirate Bay is somewhere else. Go there. Um, <laughs> like uh, Darktable is its own thing, um, much like uh, any other tool is different. Uh, you know, if you got Capture One, um, it's it's a different from Lightroom. Um, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, it is its own, its own, its own bag of, uh, its own bag of tools, its own, uh, thing, its own settings and everything. So I, I, yeah, it's not Adobe Lightroom. Don't expect Adobe Lightroom, uh, mirrored results from Darktable. Um, and that is because, uh, raw development is, a interesting beast. So, uh, out here on the left-hand column, you have uh, the data coming off your camera. These <laughs> this binary ones and zeros. This is your raw file. It's not yet an image, um, and it gets fed into three different raw processors. This is Darktable. Uh, this is another open source one called Raw Therapy, and Lightroom. And as you see here in the right-hand column, they all produce different results. That's because all of these programs do math on your raw data to produce an image. And all three of them can do different math. Um, you know, adding contrast, exposure, color, um, uh, adjusting color settings. Those are all just mathematical operations. And the exact order matters. The exact type of math you're doing matters. Um, all that stuff. And so, um, they can't be the same image. It's like having three different chefs, even if you gave them three, uh, sets of the exact same ingredients, you know, eggs, flour, milk, and told them to make a cake, they would all give you three different cakes probably. Or, you know, even if they're making the same style of cake, you know, if they were all making a chocolate cake, they would all be a little bit different because they are three different chefs with their own recipes and their own minds of going about doing things. Now, if there are three skilled chefs, uh, no one's going to say, well, this chef is clearly right. Um, because you know, they are, they are, and then that does make sense. You know, there are three interpretations of eggs, flour, milk, and whatever else goes into a cake. I'd have to look up a recipe. Um, and they are all independent and they're all valid. That's the way this kind of works. Um, you know, they all take the same data, do different operations on it and you get, these different results indicated by these different kind of color shifts here on the, um, on the final image. Um, Lightroom is not Canon. Adobe is not correct. They, you know, is not the correct way. Um, they are just a, uh, a way of doing things much like the other two. Um, it just depends on, um, um, you know, the image, your familiarity with the tool and all that stuff as to what you can get out of it sometimes. Um, I, I, coming in and expecting Darktable to duplicate Lightroom's output, I think is unreasonable and the wrong way to think about it. Um, first and foremost, Adobe Lightroom is closed sourced. Um, nobody knows how exactly how it works except for the Adobe engineers. Um, Darktable is not a project to reverse engineer Lightroom. I'm sure if it was, Adobe would have already sued it out of existence. Um, and likewise, neither is raw therapy. Um, they are their own things. Adobe is not canon. Adobe is just a, a single interpretation of your raw file, just like the other two. Uh, don't expect to get the exact same results. Um, you may not like them as much. You may like them better. It really depends. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell why I say it's not Lightroom and it can never be Lightroom. A note on scene versus display referred workflow. So there's a big kind of hubbub about this in the last few years. The terminology is still solidifying. The, the definitions and stuff um, and processes are still sort of solidifying, although they are far more solidified now than they were a couple of years ago. But Darktable has switched to what is called a scene referred workflow as opposed to a display referred workflow. Um, the last time I used Adobe Lightroom, 
that was a while ago, version five ish. Um, five, I don't think I ever bought six. No, it was like five or four. Still was very display referred. And the main difference is this on this is where the transform from camera to display color space happens. They both start with your source raw here coming from your camera. Um, and in the scene referred path, you do your color grading and corrections um, first and the same kind of mathematical and color space that your source raw lives in, which is linear. It's all linear math and algebra, right? Um, and so if you're doing that in the same space as your camera, you've got the full data available to you. Um, you're not doing any clipping or making assumptions about anything. Um, some effects are more realistic looking because they more directly mimic how the sensor works as opposed to having to go through this transform in order to uh, apply to the sauce, sauce, source. I'm spending too much time online. <laughs> source raw data. Um, and and so they look better. Um, and I think that scene referred is probably the technically superior way to go now. On the other hand, display referred does this transfer up front. So it takes your linear data, smacks it into a nonlinear space, which introduces clipping and all kinds of other things, out of gamut colors um, due to clipping. Um, and then you do your grading and corrections to get your displayed image. This wasn't so bad 10, 15 years ago when cameras only had a 6 to 8 EV of, of, of dynamic range, which was about what your display had, and um, you were assuming that your target was your display, were, and your target display and everything was correct. Um, that wasn't such a bad model. Nowadays, it's terrible because, you know, you know, a D850 or a modern Canon or a modern Fuji or Phase 1 or something's got a far bigger dynamic range. Um, we've got uh, new HDR displays coming onto the market. Um, you know, if you get one of those new fancy 10 or 12-bit displays, uh, it can display more color and a greater range of lightness and darkness values. Um, so you can... Um, more easily tune that with a scene referred work uh, workflow because all of these grading and corrections are done more directly on in the source raw space and if you want to tweak it for a wider gamut or a wider bit depth really is what i'm trying to say a wider bit depth display you just come in and you tweak your filmic transform instead of having to tweak, uh, change your transform and then redo your color gradings and corrections for your target display um, scene referred is more uh, is more um, portable and is the way to um, way to be going forward. A few years ago, you know, I said scene referred and display referred are equally val valid. I still stand by that three or four years ago. I don't think that's the case anymore. Scene referred tools have become more mature. Um, they are more feature complete now. I do everything in the scene referred space. You should be doing it too. Um, and they, it's not quite the um, immature beta version it was a few years ago. You know, when it was first introduced, it's th some things were missing. It was harder to adjust um, shadows and highlights because we didn't have the tone equalizer quite yet. Um, color balance RGB didn't exist quite yet, um, or it was like a very early version. So it wasn't quite, you know, all nailed down there yet. But it, it's there now, and I feel like scene referred is the way forward. Um, you get you just get better results. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. Why do I care? Well, I have this raw file. This is actually from like a D1X, a uh, very old camera. Uh, <laughs> so uh, not much dynamic range here, but it's a good example of what happens. This is a non-filmic transform into the display space. And you can see here this hue shift around the clouds. Um, if you think logically about it, if you adjust the exposure on an image, a color should go like a blue here, for example. It should go from a dark blue to a less dark blue to an even less dark blue to, a, you know, it should get lighter progressively until it hits white, right? Um, unfortunately, with a non-filmic transfer, transfer, it assumes that your display's 100% is pure white and it clips everything there. And so you might lose some of the blue data and you end up with this cyan color shift. 
um, with a non filmic kind of transform. And you probably, if you're my age or younger, I'm in my thirties and you're looking at this and going, well, that seems normal. Every picture I've seen has this, you know, cyan color shift in the sky. Um, yeah, you're right. That's because we grew up with digital imaging and this math and, um, it's been wrong for 20 years or more. (laughs) So, um, it's, it's incorrect, um, because of throwing away that data. Um, you should not shift hues. What should happen if you apply a filmic transform is you go as happens here near these red arrows, you go from darker blue through lighter blues and into white. That's more natural. That's what the sky actually does. It doesn't do this weird cyan color shift. Please pardon my sensor dust on that camera. Um, And so you get this kind of more film look. That's where the name comes from. I've shot some film before. Um, You know, granted, I was a little jarred by this in my digital images when I first, it it seemed kind of um, disorienting to me when I first started doing filmic and using it because I wasn't used to it. And I was like, this seems a little funny. But once uh, you kind of think about it, yeah, this is the correct way. This is how color should take. And the reason why this happens is because the filmic transform scales um, and doesn't clip. And so you don't lose those upper blues. And so you get a more clean, smooth transition to white and not this cyan business. Okay. So that's why it's important. You are getting a more accurate representation of the data and more uh, range out of your camera. A quick word on organization. Uh, Photos or files, treat them as such. Um, They aren't anything special. They're just files. Um, So create a directory structure you can maintain. Uh, I have been through three or four raw processors in my long photography career, if you can call it that. Um, But create a directory structure that makes sense to you and you can maintain. I especially want you to just stay away from the don't just dump things into the year, month, day, that and that will bite you later. Um, a lot of uh, early asset managers just would, you know, you'd import and it would do year, month, day with nonsensical names on everything in the directory structure, and it wouldn't make sense. If you later wanted to move those photos to a different raw processor or asset manager, you were lost because everything was in a proprietary database. Um, as you can see here, I have things broken down by clients, desktops, and then like I have like a photos by year directory for um you know, just my pictures, you know, I walk around my little Fuji, take pictures, and then I dump the card. Um, you know, I do a year, month, and then I break the month down into different events like astrophotography, camera collection, some kind of name that means something to me, you know, uh, grandfather mountain trip, something, something that makes sense. And then I put my photos in that folder. Renaming files with metadata seems redundant to me. Um, metadata is easily viewable on the command line and the file manager and your dark table, uh, dark tables, Lightroom area. I don't see a reason to rename it. I used to second shoot for some people and had second pe- people later had people second shooting for me. So I usually set my camera to use my initials instead of, uh, you know, how most cameras do like DSC and then like a random number for the file name. I put my initials there with a random number because that way when I second shot for people or they second shot for me back when I was doing weddings and stuff, I, um, you know, I know whose photos were whose, um, and, and stuff like that. So I have my own naming scheme that the camera imprints on it. And so I don't really rename files with like date, time and all this stuff. I just keep the file name that comes out of the camera, but I put it in a directory that's human readable, makes sense. And then in, in 10 years, dark table ceases to exist. And I want to move to the next new thing. I can just pick up my directory structure, import it and be done with it and still have, my um, existing organization and things and find things in a um, way that is separate from the software I'm using. Uh, Notes on further reading for the user at home. Um, Darktable is massive, complicated, and who has more features than you can shake a stick at? Um, docs.darktable.org is a great place to start. It's a full user manual. You can get all kinds of stuff there and they update it for every release. Uh, they do a lot of good work. Um, if you still have questions, uh, discuss that pixels.us is a uh, free and open source photography forum. Um, it does tend on the geeky side. Um, but don't let that scare you. The dark table developers hang out there. 
um, and the, uh, you know, regular users like me hang out there. Um, you know, it can get contested at times, like I said before, but it's not too bad. Um, but it's a good place to ask questions and learn. Uh, don't come in and asking if you can duplicate Lightroom's output, please. I, you know, I, I wish that would be a bannable offense at this point. <laughs> I've seen that question 800 times. Um, and of course, being an egomaniac who's giving a presentation at a Linux Fest and then uploading it to YouTube, uh, you know, you can visit my website. I've got links to my YouTube channels and other online presences there and articles I write and stuff um, on this and other subjects. So, you know, good place for further reading. Live demo. So, not too much color theory. I might talk about it a little bit. This is more of a nuts and bolts like, oh crap, how do I put my leg pants on one leg at a time and use this piece of software um, type of thing. Um, you know, just a quick edit of a couple of photos maybe and um, enough to get you started and, and get you down the road with Filmic and, and, and knowing what modules to approach in what order. It's not meant to be comprehensive, but um, just kind of like a, you know, um, lightning quick because I don't have a lot of time in this talk. I did the original talk in about an hour, so with, after the slides and everything, I didn't have a lot of talk to get into too much stuff. Um, but anyway, without much more stalling, I'm going to go ahead and get into that, and um, I will see you in Darktable. Okay, so we're here in a fresh Darktable 3.8 window. Uh, 4.0 is just around the corner. I built the code recently. Um, it's a little bit different. It's going to take some getting used to on my part. So I'm, I'm just going to work with 3.8 here because, um, <clears throat> it's the current release and it's what I know. Um, so this is what you first get when you first open Darktable. Um, first thing I do is check the settings. So I click this gear icon. Um, not much to change in here, but the thing I would check mostly is that you have OpenCL enabled. So if you go under processing, uh, activate OpenCL support, check. Um, schedule default. I leave it on default. This is my laptop. It has a Quadro A1000 in it, um, which is a four gig card. It's plenty for dark table. Um, yeah, you know, if you've got something like, um, like my desktop has a 6900 XT in it, you can set it to very fast. <clears throat> a graphics card is not explicitly required, but highly recommended either AMD or Nvidia. Um, the dark table devs prefer Nvidia just because it's a little bit CUDA is a little less buggy than Rockham. Rocco R-O-C-M on AMD side. Um, I've got both and I've experienced very little trouble out of both, but your mileage may vary. So just keep that in mind. The only other thing to look at in here is make sure that this auto apply pixel work re workflow defaults is seen referred uh, legacy uh, for the chromatic ad adaptation defaults. There is a new way of doing white balance in dark table. Um, I apply that on a per image basis. Some need it, some don't. Um, I can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, I would just leave that on legacy for now. Okay. So this is your basic, um, light table look. Um, you've got a zoomable light table. You've got a, um, file manager layout. I'll just leave it in the file manager on both sides here on the columns. You have got different tools over here. You've kind of got image tools you can use for like uh, selected images, rename, move, remove, delete, trash, ungroup. Um, you can apply state um, styles. You can copy history stacks between images. Uh, you can export all that stuff. Over here is where you get stuff into Darktable. So I'm gonna drop down the import dialog. Um, first things first here, I set my initial import rating to zero. I'm a binary person. If I wanna edit the photo and get it um, looking good and deliverable, I'll give it a five star rating. If I don't wanna mess with it, I'll give it a zero rating. Um, I do have a third state, so I guess I'm technically not binary, thinking is that uh, I will have a rejected state if I want it off my disk and delete it. Like I took a picture of my foot and it's out of focus because I dropped the camera. Don't want to keep that. Delete it. Uh, so initially I just apply everything comes in as an even zero. I select apply metadata. And my metadata preset, I usually go with a Creative Commons by NCSA. You can pick any one of these and that auto applies those rights to the image. Uh, creator, you know, I've got an ego, so I'll put my name here. Um, publisher, I usually put my website. If you've got a Flickr page or some other place to share images, you can put that there just as like a, uh, just as a place where it's published. Um, tags, uh, you want to um, put enough tags that they are unique, uh, but don't put so many that every image has the same tags. If every image is called uh, North Carolina, then no image is special. So I'm going to come in here and put self. Uh, South East Linux 
DFS, dark table, um, presentation. Um, and I'm going to add the library. I'm going to add these here. Um, I just put these in my pictures folder earlier. Uh, if you click this eyeball here, it'll show hide the thumbnail. So if you've got a bunch of images in there and you only want to select a few, you can show these thumbnails and it will um, let you better easily figure out who's who. You can just select one and import one. You can select, hold shift, select half of them. I'm going to select all of them and import them. And uh, select only new pictures. So if you've imported from this folder before, this directory before, this will exclude ones that are already in your library. Um, you can recurse over the directory. So if you've got subdirectories, uh, you know, it'll go down and pull those out. Or you, And you can ignore JPEG images if you shoot raw plus JPEG. I'm just going to add it. As you can see here, oops, I accidentally rejected that earlier. Um, you can uh, come in here and, oh, I have some metadata stored from before. I'll just clear all these. Um, it pulls them in pretty quick. This is a pretty fast machine here. Um, the graphics card does help with this. Um, a note on specs, um, you know, the bigger the images that you shoot, the more computer you need. If you're shooting with an older 10, 12, 16 megapixel camera, you can get by with a lot less computer than if you're shooting with like a 50 or if you're a really lucky uh, son of a gun and you've got a 100 megapixel phase one, you're going to need more computer even still. So it scales with your needs. Um, I have thousands of images um, and a modern quad six, you know, I would say a modern quad core is kind of the good base default for that. Um, I would go six, eight, the more cores, the better. Um, uh, and you know, a decent graphics card. I would say anything NVIDIA 9, GTX 9 series, like 970, newer. Um, on the Vega, on the AMD side, anything Vega or newer would be good for this, um, as long as it's OpenCL supported. Um, again, if you're using an older camera, you can get away with a lot less. Um, if you're using a bigger camera, you're gonna need a lot more. It's all in your hardware. All right, good. So now, we've got these in here. And you can come through here and do what I'm doing now where I am hitting five on the keyboard to give these five star ratings. You can reject, you can hit R to reject them and you can see it turns them gray. Um, there is a nifty feature actually, I'm gonna unreject all of these where say you wanna take these, if you're like me and you have a NAS at home, but you wanna work on your laptop somewhere else, you can select some images and make a local copy. So. Uh, these are all on my internal drive on this machine because this was a demo, but let's say I'm at home, I've got them on my NAS, and I want to take them with me on my laptop somewhere. You can select those, and under the Selected Images tab here, this is a really neat feature, you can say um, Copy Locally right here. And what it does, you can see it puts a little triangle in this corner here, and it creates a local copy in your .config directory for these images. So now you've got the original on your drive, you can come in here and, and do your edits. Um, so I'm just gonna come in here and do like a, yeah, just make some quick adjustments. I'm not really doing anything too spectacular with this image. I'm just kinda, you know, make something to make it look different. Um, tone equalizer, I'll go over this in more detail in the next one. Uh, pull that up. Eep, all right. Pull that down, yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, color balance RGB, add some of that, whatever. Okay, so I've done some edits to that. It looks different. Now, when I go home, I can select that image and say resync local copy, and it will send that X, uh, XMP file over to your NAS, your external hard drive, wherever you happen to have that image stored. And you can tell now if you hold over, over, um, mouse over it, you can see that it has the original file name back. Um, same with these. You can see it's got some kind of temporary image name there, there too. If we come back here and we say resync local copy, it gets rid of the um, the the little cached copy and goes back to the original. So that's a handy feature for you road warrior types. Um, I like it a lot. Next, so um, if you want to just show, filter these, you can come up here in the view in the top and you can say unstarred only, uh, you know, all the different star ratings, just zero, um, five stars, um, rejected only, all except rejected. Um, so the way I mostly use this, if I come through and rate something five stars, I'll just show the five star ones for me to edit. 
Um, I'm gonna go back here. Let me reject something. And if I say if I rejected an image, I'll say show rejected only. Click that, and then say delete or trash that image, and it'll pop up with a thing. Uh, I don't want to delete it, but you can uh, come through there, and uh, that's how I kind of cull is reject those images and send them to the trash can and delete them. Um, you can use that for that. You can use these tools um, in that manner to kind of filter out your images and get rid of the ones you don't want. Now, let's go in and edit this image here. Um, this is a very uh, underexposed sunset. It was, or sunrise, excuse me. It was on purpose because um, I was bracketing. First things first, I'm gonna take a snapshot. And that takes our current history state, um, which if you look here, this is by default. I didn't do any of this. Darktable does this on its own. Remember, a raw file is just a bucket of bits. To you demosaic it, uh, match it to a color matrix, and convert it to your display color space, it's not really an image. Right, so um, all of this stuff kind of happens by default just to show you the image. So that's what that all is. So I'm gonna come in here next and start making adjustments. Um, in fact, I'm gonna collapse this side down just to get a better view of the image. And expand this column. You can just click and drag here. See how you get these little side by arrows. You can kind of make that bigger or smaller. Um, and I'm gonna go through here. On the first one, you have the quick, the first tab is the quick access panel. Um, this is where you have some quick adjustment sliders. If you keep click these little escape boxes, it'll take you into the full module in the interface. Um, I don't really use this that much because I've got a few modules that I like and use, so I've kind of got it pared down already. Uh, the power button is the modules that you have on right now. Um, so obviously, you know, sharpening, filmic is on, exposure, uh, demosaic, you have to demosaic in order for it to be an image etc. Technical, this is where um, Filmic lives. Um, technical modules, corrections, think of it like that. Lens correction, highlight reconstruction, white balance, that all lives in here. Um, color, color grading and uh, kind of creative stuff lives in this tab. Um, this is where tone equalizer lives, where I was adjusting the shadows and highlights earlier. Color balance RGB, where you can do color, um, color grading and all that stuff, that all lives in here. The last tab is your special effects. This is your watermarking, your retouching. Uh, retouching is quite nice. You can come in and remove blemishes or sensor crud or in all kinds of stuff right in dark tables. So that's nice. And that all lives in here. Local contrast, that sort of stuff. I don't use too much of that, but it is there. So where do we start with this image? It's a bit underexposed, I think. Again, I was bracketing. So I'm going to bring that up um, and, and start to bring in some shadows detail. Notice down here at the bottom, you've got these five or six icons. What is it? One, two, three, four, five, what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven icons. Excuse me. I can't count today. Uh, in order, these are focus peaking, which pretty self-explanatory shows you where the, it thinks your camera was focused based on how sharp it is there. Um, these are your 12, six, four, six. Yeah. 12, six, four, six, um, color, um, environment. Uh, assessment um, things. This basically gives you this little white border. And I, I use that a lot because I find I make fewer <clears throat> color mistakes doing that. Um, this like checkerboard pattern here is your color, um, your raw clipping. So if I zoom in here, I'm just using my mouse wheel. You can see there's a little slight bit of raw clipping where you see this checkerboard pattern right where the sun was starting to come out. That means that the sensor was washed out. Uh, you got... This is the clipping indication for your current display, and this will show clipping for any color. You notice up here in the histogram, we are clipping red. Uh, that's what it's showing. Uh, soft proofing for like printing and sending to different devices and stuff. Uh, gamut checking, so this is um, checking for added gamut colors. You can right click on it and you can see um, what, dis what, what, what profile you're gamut checking for. Um, we won't really get into that. The one thing I do like to change here is the guidelines. I come in here and by default they're gray. I don't find those standing out too well. So I right click and I change those to red usually. Ah, that's better. I can see those better. Um, this comes into play later when you want to do the crop module. In fact, we'll hide that. And I'll show you a quick trick here. Uh, you can search for modules in this search box. So we're going to do crop and there's crop. And I'm going to change that to uh, CinemaScope, right? Okay, yes. And I'm going to show guides. 
And there's your guides, and you see they're red now. And I like just the wide. This looks panoramic to me, so I'm just going to do that. Right, that looks good. So that is where your guides come into play. Now they're red. And you can come in here into the hash tag looking thing there, the pound symbol, and change it in here too. You can change it to green, red, and gray. Um, there was all sorts of different um, grid types, I guess. You can go by rule of thirds, spirals, all that, whatever. All right, cool deal. So we've cropped. We're going to come in here and we've adjusted exposure. That's good. We're getting a little bit of clipping in here. That's going a little white. I don't like that. So we're going to hit Filmic RGB next. And this is a one-stop shop of sorts. It allows you to adjust the dynamic range, the look of your photo, um, and all kinds of other settings, all in one uh, module with just a few tabs. So first thing you notice is your, dyna your dynamic range, kind of uh, scenes dynamic range here. So you've got this big slider at the bottom that adjusts both your black and your white point simultaneously. And you can see where it's getting more details in. And if you go negative, it's going to give you less dynamic range and more clipping. If you go positive, it's going to give you more dynamic range and less clipping. So we're going to go positive here a little bit. Um, the top slider is your white relative exposure. This is how many EVs are between middle gray, 18%, and <clears throat> white on your display. You can just drag that and adjust that. You can see we get quite a lot there in the sky. Same thing with the black relative exposure. It's um, either direction, white, or, um, or you know, the distance between black, uh, solid black, and your uh, middle gray. So we're going to bring that in because I want some more density down there. All right, that looks pretty good. That's a lot of dynamic range. That's really pushing this sensor. This is a D800, so it's kind of old now. Um, highlight reconstruction. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to bring that in a little bit more. I think that's just getting a little pale there for me. Um, this is, if you've clipped some highlights, this really handles the transition from highlights to clipping. Um, I don't, we don't really need to mess with it here because, well, we haven't clipped anything, so we won't touch it as far, but you can, um, mess with this. I usually bring the threshold down a little bit if I have some clipping just to, make that um, a little bit smoother. I found that works better. Um, another thing I use this for is if I backlit a subject, like a portrait or something with the sun backlighting it, the person, um, I bring this threshold down here so that I get a pure white in the background. Um, otherwise, Filmic will really fight you and try to get most because it's geared to getting the most dynamic range. It really wants to bring those highlights back in. So you have to come in here and slap it a little bit to get it to <laughs> to not do that. Um, look, this is all look of your photo. This is all beautification stuff. So we're going to come in here and add some contrast a little bit, maybe. Um, shadows, highlights, balance. I also mess with that. So if you go to the highlight side, you can see you get a little bit more space in your highlights um, at the cost of your shadows. And if you go to the shadow side, you get a little bit more um, space in your shadows at the cost of your highlights. I'm going to go a little bit towards the shadows, I think. Um, latitude just expands that amount of space you have, um, but also makes the contrast uh, sharper. At, uh, gives you more uh, a sharper curve down here at your shadows and your highlights. So you can see when I move, whoops, wrong one. If I move this around, those two curves get uh, more intense, or those two points on the curve get more intense, and so you get stronger highlights and stronger shadows. So I'm going to leave that there. I might bring that in a little bit. Display, uh, this is target black and white luminance. So, you know, you can give it that kind of, uh, this gives you like a flattened white or a flattened black look. So you can bring that target black luminance up a little bit and give you that kind of a little bit of a faded Instagram kind of look if you want. We'll do that. Have a little fun. Uh, the options. You can mostly you leave this alone. Uh, preserve chrominance is probably the one I mess with the most. Um, I find there's no right answer here. <laughs> it's just kind of... Which one looks better? I think Max RGB sometimes looks better. Eh, Luminance doesn't look good. Um, these are all do doing um, different kinds of math to determine um, the method for keeping the uh, um, the original colors preserved. Um, so there's not really a right answer. It's just kind of what looks good for that particular photo, right? So we come in here, bring that back in a little bit. Yeah, we're getting some good, good, good detail in that. All right, so Filmic, we're done. 
with that module. Now, if we want to take a take a snapshot here, you can come in and uh, here's our original photo. You can see where we started with and where we're at so far, right? Yeah, we've taken a very underexposed photo and we've actually gotten some details in it. Next stop, I go into my color grading. Um, I usually go into tone equalizer first. This is like your shadows and highlighter, highlighters, shadows and highlights, not highlighters. This is going on a while now. <laughs> um, so this is your shadows side, this is your highlight side. Um, so you can adjust this up and down to adjust those values either way, um, to increase exposure or decrease exposure in a certain region. If you see this orange triangle, come under masking and adjust your mask exposure compensation until you get this box all the way in the middle with no orange on one side. That just means that you're out of bounds on this graph and you need to adjust your mask a little bit to get it back in. So now, where we've got all this data here, you can adjust this. You can bring your highlights up and bring my shadow, my my shadows up, my highlights down a little bit. All right, all right, that's looking all right. And you can do an on-off comparison. You can blink. I might bring those highlights back up a little bit. That's a little much for me. I like them to be a little paler. Um, let's see, I might bring those down and get a good sharp contrast black in there. I'm gonna go into white balance here. Uh, this is probably not the proper way to do this. You want to use a color adapt to transform, but I'm trying to keep it simple here. I'm just going to bring a little bit of the warmth out of that so it's not quite so red. All right. Cool. And uh, that looks better. We got the... Yeah. All right. We got a little bit more um, detail in your image there. I could take this color assessment conditions off make it a little bit bigger. Um, next, color balance RGB. Um, uh, add some colorfulness to it. There's a setting in here called like add uh, basic colorfulness. Uh, it sometimes does okay. I'm usually not a fan of it though. It usually goes a little hard. Um, I'll bring those in a little bit. Um, I bring up the saturation some. Uh, the older versions of Filmic really were anemic when it came to saturation that has improved greatly um sometimes you can i come in here into um mid-tone saturation bring that up a little bit you can also change this view here this is the look only view which gives you the tone curve of what your of what filmic is doing to convert it you can click your a here and give you a legend so this is your um top range of where you have your scene set to plus seven, six, your bottom range, 14 stops. That ain't too bad for a 10 year old camera. Um, and your percent of display. So hundred percent, you can see where it's kind of taking that and, and putting a stronger, stronger curve on it towards the highlights and towards the shadows. Uh, we can come in here, we can drop that back a little bit to get some of those blacks back uh, instead of doing the Instagram look, ah, whoopsie. So you can just double click something to reset it back to defaults. If you, accidentally screw something up. You can see how I'm moving that around and that's, you know, the the um the saturation is increasing the um the amount of data under this curve. Um you can also change your view here. The only other one I really use is the dynamic range mapping because this shows you where where your camera data lines up with your display and how the two interact. And so, you know, you can come under a scene here and you can see where zero um zero uh, percent black corresponds to what EV in the uh, sensor data so we can do that um, or you can do the same thing with the highlights we want to preserve those highlights so in fact I'm gonna come under color balance RGB and I might yeah, I'm gonna cut that down there we go just a little bit and a dab, color grading I find a dab will do you a gob will screw you so <laughs> I tend to keep it simple um, next, so lens correction. It uses lens funds, so we can come under here. It's already got a profile, so it's just going to do that. Uh, denoise, profile denoise, same thing. It's already got a profile for this camera, so it's going to pull out. Ah, uh, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to look at that screen. That uh, snapshot will click that off. And, you know, you can come in here and 
denoise that. Yeah, bring out some of the noise. All cameras have a little bit of noise. I would recommend cutting on that module. You may not need it so strong. Maybe bring it back a little bit. Um, another one I sometimes use, diffuser sharpen. There's a good, this helps. Uh, you can um, sharpen the demosaicing a little bit, especially with an older camera like this that still had an anti-aliasing filter. I find that sometimes useful to do to get a little bit of um, uh, display sharpening back. Let's see, that's, um, let's see. I'm not liking the way that's looking. I'm going to go back to the doink. That. Maybe, maybe pale that out a little bit so it's not so unnatural looking. But, yeah, there you go. So, we have, let's see, take a snapshot. Let's go back to here. We've gone from that to that in a few minutes, right? So, that's the power of Filmic. That's the power of Darktable. Um, this was a very basic edit just to show you where I got this from, how I got here. Um, you can change so many other things. I'm really just scratching the surface here. Um, this is a very powerful raw editor, I think on par with Adobe um, Capture One and all of those. Um, you really should give it a shot. Um, thanks for watching my presentation. Normally itself, I asked for, you know, questions, but I can't do that on YouTube. If you do have a question, you can put it in the doobly-doo. Yes, I am back on this channel. I'm going to start putting my photography stuff back on this channel specifically and segregating my content a little bit. So watch this space. Um, if you want to see something in particular, let me know. I'm going to be playing with Darktable 4 when it comes out here soon or when it gets nearer to coming out. Um, but again, Thanks for watching. Um, if you didn't make it to self this year, um, maybe come next year. I'd plan on maybe doing another talk um, and seeing about that. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it wasn't too bad of a time this time, though. Um, and we will see you. And, well, we. Who is our mouse in my pocket? I will see you next time. I've been trying to record this too long. It's getting late at night. I'm getting a little loopy. So I'm going to let it go for now. Thanks for watching my talk and um, hope you learned something.